you want to do us both? And All right, good evening, everyone. Just let me know when to get out. Good evening, everyone. Ah. This is interactive night, so I just want to get you all warmed up here. And it, it is a little warm, so I'll just take my jacket off. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone to the St. Petersburg Psych Cafe series. My name is Howard Rutherford. I am the Director of Development over at USF College of Marine Science. For those of you who haven't joined us for a previous Science Cafe, it's very simple. Have a drink and think. Uh, this is, this is uh, formatted to be interactive, so... During the conversation tonight, if you have a comment or if you have a question, please don't hesitate to blurt it out. Um, I'm also happy to say that the bar will be open until 7 tonight. So if you feel the need for speed to go outside and have another cocktail, please feel free. Um, this, is, this series uh, was created in 2009 by our, our public aquarium here called Secrets of the Sea Marine Exploration Center and Aquarium, of which I'm still a part of on the board. Um, but we couldn't do this without our sponsors, especially the Dali as our host um, for the series here. So thank you to the Dali Museum. Um, Hearn Hoyt Ramsey uh, Wealth Management Group for sponsoring the series. And of course, USF College of Marine Science. Uh, Rob Lorai, who is the news director for WMNF, has been moderating this series for a number of years. Thank you very much, Rob. And I'm going to let Rob introduce our guest panelists tonight. So sit back, enjoy. And again, the bar is open until 7, and we look forward to this conversation. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. Um, Howard didn't give me much advice about where we're going to go tonight. Um, he did say that we should keep it X-rated. So, um, you know, Howard, I think this is a bigger crowd than we had for the organic chemistry. Um, no! The big O. The big O. No, no, this is, this is a bigger crowd than we had for organic chemistry. But... Is that the sex toys? Well, we did, we did do sex toys two years ago. So how many here, people were here for sex toys? Oh, so, really? A returning really audience. Customers. So I, I think we had a satisfied group of customers. <laughs> um, so what, I, I want you to jump in. I can't see all of you, um, but uh, if you just want to say, hey, Rob, I've got a sexy question. Um, we're, we're, we'll, uh, we'll start there when you, when you chime in. Uh, our two guests are Debbie Casill, who's an associate professor in the Department of Biological Services here at USF St. Petersburg, and Dave Sheridan is a licensed psychotherapist, a board-certified clinical sexologist, and a certified rehabilitation counselor. And I'm going to have Debbie just kind of describe, based on the topic tonight, uh, that is uh, swinging ain't just for monkeys, monogamy, and polygamy in the animal kingdom. So, uh, Debbie, uh, I'm going to let you take it, but just talk about how your field interacts or intersects with the topic of our conversation tonight. Happy to do that. My first degree was in psychology, and I realized very quickly that the interesting behaviors were not so much human as they were animals. So I went back and at the age of 49 got a PhD in biology. And here's what I teach. It's all about survival and reproduction, which means 90% of what I talk about is food and sex. It just doesn't get more interesting than that. <laughs> My classes are full to capacity, attendance is high, and I will in a short while give you just a brief introduction into sex in the animal world and how really kinky animals are, far more than humans. So, <laughs> you'll enjoy. That's a hard one to follow. Yeah. Oh, not at all. So, thanks for having me. I'm Dr. Day Sheridan, and along with being a licensed mental health counselor, I'm also a professor of human sexuality at USF in the Rehabilitation Mental Health Counseling Program, to which we have a field trip tonight. Raise your hands if you're in. Woo! So, very excited. It's our, it's our first class tonight, so hello, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you. Kind of a, a different situation that we're having tonight, but I'm really excited to be here 
And as a clinical sexologist, uh, I have a private practice as well as teaching at USF. So I see people for all different realms and issues in terms of sexuality, whether it's um, spicing things up in a marriage, whether it's sexual trauma, um, and, and or helping people give themselves permission to be sexual beings, which animals are really good at. They don't they have all of the stigma and taboo and things that um, we have placed on ourselves as humans, which then kind of block us from our own sexuality. So um, it's kind of what I talk about every single day, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, <laughs> Debbie, you brought some slides. I did. Are, are these appropriate for this audience? Oh, they are. Okay. As long as you're 18 and older. All right. Actually. So I'm going to move out of the way. You then. can be, oh, you're fine. Oh, okay, yeah. I don't, I don't know where my head's going to be, so I'm going to go. You can be I'm six years out. old and watch <laughs> this. It's just, it's just animals. So. Did, did you call this animal porn? Is that what you call this? Let me see if, yeah, animal pornography. It just doesn't get any better than this. Um, let's see if I can, I think. Okay, lights down a little bit. Oh, John, my man back in the little box there. Excellent. This is what every animal who makes it to maturity, and most of them don't, they die as adolescents. But when you, if you live to maturity, it is the goal of males to get their sperm to the egg, and there are thousands if not millions of ways of doing that. But here's what I want to infect your minds with. The sperm are small in many. The thing that they deliver to the egg is a second set of DNA, kind of a backup system, in case there are mutations in the, the egg's DNA. But once that little backup a uh, bit of DNA makes it into the egg. It is the egg that then has all of the chemicals, and talk about uh, bio, ocean biochemistry and all of that, it's all chemistry. And only females have the eggs, and only females reproduce offspring. So we're the big, we're the big deal. The males, for the most part in the animal kingdom, donate sperm, and then they're gone. It's up to the female to... Uh, produce, you know, let the little parasite grow in our bodies for a while and then exit. And if we're a mammal or a bird, then it's an external parasite for a number of years until it's full grown. That's not true with most animals, but that's a story for another day. Oh, I think I can do this. So this is, uh, anybody know what this animal is? Sponge. Yeah. And let me tell you a story, guys. Gentlemen, you'll love this. Ladies, maybe not so much. Once a year, in November, after the first quarter moon has risen, and following the next morning, there are species of, of sponges that ejaculate for three hours their sperm. A six feet in the air. Now imagine, guys, three hours, six feet in a water column. And that sperm is set free and then taken in by the females and who are producing the eggs. It's an amazing event, once a year. I've often wondered, wouldn't it be fun just to have a, a sexual period in our lives, maybe months, you know, two or three months where we really focus on finding a mate, and then we're done and we can party and fly and migrate like the rest of the animal kingdom? <laughs> Doesn't happen. These are flatworms, so I'm going to kind of go up the animal kingdom here. They are uh, about the size of my hand, and John, can you hit the, hit the uh, video? These are penises, and it's called penal fencing, penis fencing, really sexy stuff. Mm -hmm. and the Shape of Life photographic team have set up a special tank to film a flatworm's unique mating behavior. These are two males. Music. <laughs> 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 the first animal courtship was like, but these 
flatworms can show us how even simple animals add their own twist. For them, sex is more like a war than love. It's known as penis fencing, and the worms are the source of it. From the midsection of each flatworm, double daggers protrude. Each dagger is actually a penis. So the amazing thing about these um, animals, do I need to do anything? Ah, good. Is that their whole body is a vagina. It's our, you know, we have it, most animals have a specific target by which the penis has, the shaft has to get to. But for this animal, anywhere on its back or even on its front. So it's an amazing um, biological design and very successful for animals that don't run into each other very often. Um, most animals do a dorsal ventral sexual position. And I find this amazing because she never sees her vagina. He never sees her vagina. She never sees his penis. He never sees his penis. And yet, they're able to manipulate and uh, coordinate with each other so that his penis uh, enters her vagina and the goal of getting the sperm to the egg is, is met. We see this position in most animals. This is one I love. <laughs> so and I have videos on YouTube. It's amazing. Again, she doesn't move. She has to bear his weight, and he's like many, uh, you know, a, a thousand or two pounds, if not more. Um, his shaft has to be exactly because she's got a small opening here to, 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 for him to find, and again, he can't see it. Um, his shaft has to be so long and straight and at the right angle, and he's got a limited amount of time before she wears down and just walks away. <laughs> this really isn't that different. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. And it's just, it's remarkable. And he has to be tall enough. Otherwise, he's putting a shaft between her legs, and that's just not going to help. It'll help him, maybe, but it's not going to get her what she wants. <laughs> And again, same thing. Just most animals. <laughs> Here we've got which one is the more mature male? The middle one or the top one? The middle. And how can you tell? The size of the antlers, absolutely. And that's how we can tell he's a male. Why would this male, whoopsie, why would, uh, why would this male allow the other male to mate? Somebody raise your hand, give me an answer. He's busy. Yeah. <laughs> He's busy, that's exactly right. <laughs> an A for you or extra point for you. So if he disengages from the female that he's finally cajoled into mating and chases this other male off, he loses. Mm -hmm. And the second male is actually just practicing. Again, <laughs> not so different from humans. This one I love because they're one of the few animals, which we'll talk about and see in a minute, that actually mate face to face. And, and John, if you can run the second uh, documentary, this is an amazingly sensuous mating strategy. 
but there was another meat. In the sea, animals need only release their eggs and sperm and the water needs to feed each other. On dry land, that couldn't happen, even for the most moisture loving of creatures. An individual slug carries both male and female organs, but even then, that was of no help. Each had to both give and receive. Somehow or other, pairs of individuals had to get together, and the ways they had evolved in which to do so are quite extraordinary. Indeed, some of them are almost beyond imagining. The leopard slug, you might think, has the simplest of habits. Maybe, but not when it comes to mating. When an individual is looking for a partner, it gives it a trail of slime, a special taste that advertises the fact. Another, if it feels the same way, will detect the invitation and start to follow. The pursuer, to confirm that it's there and ready to mate, gives the pursued a nibble. A love bite. <laughs> the leader heads upwards. An overhand is what's needed. The underside of a branch would do very nicely. The two start to circle one another more and more closely until they entwine. For an hour or so, they continue to wind themselves around one another. Foreplay, an hour. <laughs> <laughs> bungee cord. The penis. And they have a life of their own, a mind of their own. It's amazing. These are two males. Yeah, as far as I know it is. <laughs> and he's ready for, both of them are ready for a cigarette. <laughs> so most animals do the dorsal ventral uh, doggy style, and only a few animals do face-to-face. -face. The snails are one, and the dolphin are another. The manatees are another, and there's lots of masturbation, uh, which is occurs more in mammals than any other group. Certainly the primates make face-to-face. -face. And we see the penises, we see the vaginas, we have prehensile fingers and arms where we can kind of guide our mate to, uh, to position the shaft into the vagina. 
The odd thing is we do this in private, which is highly unusual and not in public, which most animals do, and we do it all year long, which is highly unusual, and most of our mating is not for reproduction. We have all these kinds of reproductive blocks to uh, prevent mating. We're gonna talk about monogamy, which is rare, 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 and more rare in the animal kingdom. Most animals uh, are polygamous, and most animals, uh, only mate with their own species. <laughs> we often mate with other species, and that's true of women as well. And we're gonna deal with monogamy and polygamy, uh, and uh, Dr. Sheridan will kind of walk us through our, maybe our biological urge to seek other partners, and that's all I have to say about animals and sex, but we're gonna open it up to your questions, and uh, lights on, please. Okay, Debbie, that was great. I need to cool off. Oh, I know, <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> Those snails made me so happy. I know. I well, want to be a snail for a day. I want well, to experience that. So many questions raised by that. But let me start with the, <clears throat> a, a general question, and that is, it seems to me that the purpose of sex in humans and the purpose of sex in, in animals is quite different. You talked about foreplay. I never thought about foreplay in animals. But, it, but I mean, I, I think what we all learned in biology class is that animals mate to procreate, and we mate a lot of times for pleasure and to procreate. Um, what about that? I mean, is there any misunderstanding there, or, or how would you... I'll handle that, if you're okay with that. So the reason we are biologically programmed to have or multiple orgasms, organ, orgasms, sorry, um, females and males as well, we a little bit more often than you, um, is... You personally? Yeah, well, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> Being a male, on average, on average, is that we're social, we females, uh, as a species, we've lost our canines, our claws. We have no thick hide or armor to, to protect ourselves from predators. What we do as a social species is we rely on safety in numbers. And if there's a predator and there are 10 of us, we have one chance in 10 of being eaten. If we're the only one there, it's 100% probability that we'll be eaten. So social, it's very important for us to bond and in terms of relationships, especially, well, male-male, female-female, or male-male, male-female, I'll get it right, um, or get all three of them, is that if we offer sex and pleasure, we create a bond that lasts longer than uh, a casual acquaintance or a friendship. And that bond allows us to protect and rear and be more successful in raising offspring. So the sex we offer is really to maintain that bond. And if we've gone to a lot of trouble in courtship to find a mate that we find acceptable on both sides for male uh, and female, we want to nurture that bond because we value the sperm, we value the eggs. It's not like we're thinking about it, but biologically, that's our imperative. That's our drive, that's our motivation. Mm -hmm. Mente, what would you um, add to that? Well, according to sexuality education in the United States, uh, procreation is the only option. Pleasure is not available to any of us, and um, it's about uh, penis in vagina for babies. And so, good night, everybody. There's nothing, else. There's nothing else for us discuss for us to discuss here. So we do an awful job of educating our children and ourselves. I have so many people who tell me, as adults, and whether it's in my graduate class or in my practice or friends or somebody at Target online who I happen to chat with, um, who tell me that they've never heard some of the things or learned about some of the things that we talk about and. Um, so an example would be, uh, boys have a penis and girls have a? Vagina. No. Girls ha boys have a penis and girls have a? Who said vulva? Woo! Yes, yes, yes. 
So we, our issue is that we teach children oh. from the inside out. So if you've ever been in that fifth grade, sixth grade puberty talk where it's girls on one side of the gym, boys on the other, then what you have learned is that, okay, well boys, um, they learn about nocturnal emissions, they learn about erections, they learn about what's going on right here. And girls learn about some sort of a majestic, magical ram head with, with horns <laughs> that someday will make a child, um, and when you're 9, 10, 11, when you receive that one-time talk about the birds and the bees, about your <laughs> internal reproductive system, it's really all you need, right? Yeah. You all got exactly what you needed from that one-time talk. So we need to strive to make uh, not only the talk, but a, developmental, a developmentally appropriate set of conversations through the ages and stages. Uh, we're, I'm still learning about the snails. I mean the snails. I'm still learning. <laughs> so, you know, we, we do a really poor job. And we teach our kids about our internal, especially for girls. So this is very sexist, the way that we teach about human sexuality. Um, in our country because we teach the boys about the outside and we're like, oh, boys will be boys. They're going to be tugging on that thing. We're not worried about it. But, <laughs> but goodness forbid that you know a little girl, when the diaper comes off, the hands go right there, which anybody who has ever had a child knows that exactly that's what happens. Children are known. We see um, sonograms of babies masturbating in utero. And what happens is, is we, real, we teach the boys about the outside and their, and their genitalia, and we teach girls about this majestic, magical thing that they can only imagine, and then there's no name for it at all. And so we talk about, we don't talk about that because of pleasure. And we're afraid to discuss pleasure. When so are we hiding girls. women's pleasure? I mean, as a society, do we do, we do that? And, and tell us how we could better express that to young girls. Absolutely, because good girls don't he around here. And so, you know, there are, if you think of all of the most, what is the absolute worst thing you can call somebody on earth? <laughs> what? Say it out loud. I can't say that word. <laughs> <laughs> Cunt, pussy, dick, fuck you, screw you, asshole. I love you all. I don't mean that. I <laughs> but what did you hear me say? You heard me say the words that in America we use to describe our genitalia and making love. The words that we use to describe the parts of us that give and receive pleasure wholly and fully, and the parts of us that are responsible for giving life. And we diminish it so terribly because we are afraid of pleasure and turning it into a bad, dirty thing that we don't want to talk about. So if, if we were to look at the, the amount of knowledge that we have about male orgasm versus female mm -hmm. orgasm, if you were to compare the amount of knowledge generally in US society, um, if male orgasm, we have, let's say, 85% let's say knowledge of how to achieve it, how would, how would you describe how far along we are in terms of women's orgasm? You're, you're, I'm like, if, if, we're, if we're, I was we're, down there, over by the shoes over there, and honestly, um, some of the uh, biological and uh, human sexuality textbooks that have come out in the last five years just start to show the crura. You guys are familiar with the crura, of course, right? No. Oh, of course not. So the crura, <laughs> exactly. So the crura is another uh, terminology for what's called the clitoral legs. A lot of people talk about um, what their understanding of the clitoris is. Um, the clitoris is actually analogous to the male penis. It is erectile. It is born from the same tissue that the, pe the shaft of the penis is created from uh, prior to sexual differentiation of the, um, of the, uh, the um, help fetus. Me yes, of the fetus, thank yeah. you. Embryo. Of the embryo. And so um, the crura, uh, the clitoral legs, are within the, um, the 
underneath a pubic bone that is, so if you, this is, so let's say this is our vulva. Everybody, this is your vulva right here. Do you want to And point? so the clitoris is at the top <laughs> of the vulva, and everybody thinks a bit about it as like a little, like a pea, but it's actually shaped more like a string bean um, and is usually about the length and width of your own pinky finger. So, um, what happens is that we've always talked about the clitoris. So we went from it being just a little pea that you can see on the outside that's a ball. And then we discovered, oh, it's actually erectile and it's lengthened and it lengthens and widens upon arousal, just like the penis does. And it's about the length and the width of your pinky finger. We've also discovered, well, it doesn't just stop there. It's more like a wishbone. So it starts here. And then the clitoral legs, here's your vulva. So the clitoris is here. There's your erect clitoris, everybody. And so then your clitoral legs actually go all the way around the frame of the vulva around the uh, labia majora. And so if you enjoy being stimulated in that way, that's because there's more clitoris out there, people, and we need to know about these things. <laughs> and so yes, we're very poorly um, read on, on such topics because we don't see the value in discussing them. Okay, I want, later on I want to ask you about the G-spot, but I want to get back to Debbie for a moment. Debbie, um, you talked about foreplay in the animal kingdom right. uh, in your presentation. Um, uh, it, it seems unnecessary, foreplay, first of all, and, and second of all, uh, do animals de uh, derive pleasure or have orgasm during sex? Is that the reason they're motivated? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Every animal from a flatworm on up has a brain and a nervous system. And we now know through neural science that the neurons that make up our nervous system we can transplant one from a flatworm into my brain and it would function. Oxytocin, melatonin, dopamine, uh, gabapentin, adrenaline, norepinephrine, all those chemicals by which our brain neurons talk to each other and by which we feel emotions and fear, uh, like fear and pleasure, uh, are, ident are identical across the animal kingdom. They've been conserved. They're that important to finding a mate and uh, finding food. It's that the circuitry is different. It's just like the circuitry of a cell phone is different from a computer, but the, the, the main electrical parts are, are the same. So yes, animals feel pain and pleasure physically. They feel it emotionally. They feel attachment. Uh, the uh, flatworms, when the, the penal fencing, penis fencing, love that. Um, when they go up, they're aroused and they recognize each other uh, chemically more than visually, but they know that they're here to battle and fight to dominate the other male and impregnate the other male. And that sense of arousal sticks with them. What happens when the one is impregnated is all the testosterone that was causing the battle and the fight increases with the winning male, and he goes off to fight again. And the losing male, the testosterone goes away, and estrogen kicks in, and the eggs are now formed, and there's sperm ready for them to um, fuse with, with the egg. So the courtship does many things. Same thing for us. Are you of my species? Are you mature? Are you uh, willing? And are you a good mate? So during courtship, all those things, all that information is being communicated. You, you talked about those chemicals. One mm -hmm. of those that j jumps out at me, and I don't know the whole list, but oxytocin. And, and, right. and, and my understanding is that oxytocin is released during the act of orgasm, right. and that makes you bond with your partner. So could you talk about that? And could you talk about that list of chemicals too, Day, about that are released during sex? I mean. And, and the role that they play in us bonding with each other uh, when we have sex. Do you want to just Sure, do I that? work with ants. The queen lays eggs and she goes through the same uteral contractions and it doesn't just pop out, it's, it's an effort for her. And I am uh, doing a study with somebody over at USF Tampa where we're going to, bless their hearts, grind the queens up and look for oxytocin. Uh, at, during the egg laying phase of their physiology. It's never been done. I'm 98.9% .9 certain that we're gonna find it. Again, the, uh, animals are people too. And 
for years, decades, we've learned don't anthropomorphize. You know, animals are just robotic, and we're now realizing that they are as emotional and if not more emotional in their bonding and their relationships with other animals as we are. Well, sometimes, especially as a psychotherapist, I wish that um, we did a little bit more the way that do things a little bit more the way that animals do because we are idiots when it comes to our neurotransmitters <laughs> and our homo, our hormones we don't listen at all mm -hmm. okay so uh, we don't listen to the fact that um, we are the only species that we have that our amygdala will fire up and say um, fight or flight there's danger here and we go oh it's gonna be fine. We're the only species that doesn't hightail it and run. We don't pay attention to such things. And when it comes to bonding, we don't necessarily think about that either. So when we're newly dating, what happens is, is that our brains fire up with a, with a delicious cocktail of dopamine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, all of the sexy, sexy things that if you were to do brain mapping studies of someone who is newly in love or crushing on someone and someone who is high on cocaine, so, and raise your hand if you've made your best decisions. Well, no, I'm kidding. I, I don't, <laughs> but I have never heard of or met anybody who makes all of their best decisions while high on cocaine. Yet here we are, falling in love over and over, enjoying each other, and not listening to that. And part of what happens and why we don't listen to that is called the halo effect. The halo effect is where we place, um, if we, we're, of course, because of our, our much more highly um, evolved brains, we think we know better than some of that fight or flight stuff or our gut instincts telling us, don't go into the danger. Oh, I'll be fine. He's cute. So, um, <laughs> so what happens is, is that we're also very egotistical in that we believe that what we believe is the best thing ever. So if I'm sexual attracted to you, then of course you're going to be, um, you're going to be highly evolved. You're going to have great sperm to mate with. You're also you love puppies. You visit your grandma every weekend. You're incredibly wealthy and gorgeous, and you volunteer all of your time to philanthropic activities. <laughs> Well, so when we're newly in love and our brains are firing up like they're high in cocaine, what happens is is that we 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 go and we go like this with little things, those those signals and signs, like, oh, you know, maybe he's just having a bad day. I don't know why he just yelled at the waitress about the steak like that. Um, you know, or oh, isn't it adorable the way that she just makes a mess of the kitchen and doesn't think to clean it up, even though we've just worked together to cook the meal. So when we're dealing with that halo effect and we're madly in what's called limerence, it's, a, it's the midway between lust and love, where we're really, really crushing and excited. And another thing that our brains do in terms of chemicals is our serotonin levels are raised to that of someone who looks like they have chronic obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> so That's when you're brilliant. checking your phone to see if they texted yet, <laughs> and you're checking, checking, rechecking, checking, oh my gosh, I think I have to reboot my phone. There must be something wrong with it. Um, that is your serotonin levels going along with your neurochemistry just really making a mess of things. So we don't listen to what our brains and our bodies are telling us. We go head first and headlong into things that may not be good for us because we make excuses, we rationalize, we intellectualize because we are more highly evolved, that doesn't necessarily get us to where um, we need to be in terms of mating. Uh, Debbie, it, it seems to me that animals, as we saw with the slugs, are, are following a scent oftentimes mm -hmm. and attracted to that scent. And I want to ask you, is that the way it works purely in animals? And then, Day, I want to ask you, are we attracted to scents? I mean, because sometimes you lock your eyes on somebody, you fall in love, you know, you may be in a restaurant or a bar or wherever at a concert. Thank you. Uh, I feel the same way. Uh, so, but, but you know that the two of you are destined, you know, to, to have a relationship. But, but is, that, is that because I like your scent or, you know, so Debbie, could you start that conversation? So it's called pheromones. Mm -hmm. And those are chemicals that our bodies uh, send out in a volatile form, and they're retrieved by not so much our nose as an organ in our nose, and it's the veromaso, do you remember? I can never remember. And bulb. Yeah, who said? Bulb. Yeah, good job. Yeah. Extra credit point. ENT? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
and and it's it's specifically designed to select the opposite sex. And uh, I've heard studies, uh, read studies, that um, humans have that bulb. And what they tend to do is reject individuals that smell a lot like our brothers and father, or mothers and daughter and sisters, and smell less, but not too far away from. So uh, it prevents inbreeding, allegedly. But yeah, animals are much more about smell. Uh, again, depending on the animal, a lot of mammals are as visual as we are. Um, most animals in the uh, non-vertebrate, non-backbone group uh, operate more on, on oh, scent. On yeah, and again, it identifies, are you my species? Are you of the opposite sex? Are you mature? Do you have eggs or sperm? and gives them a lot of information very quickly. So Dave, can you bottle uh, some pheromones for us? Or, well, I mean, there I... actually, there are, the last of, if you turn to the back of Maxim Magazine or Cosmo, <laughs> you'll, there are plenty of people selling it and swear up and down that that's Do, what's Does it work? To. Um, uh, research is uh, not conclusive in that area, uh, but we do have, it's interesting, one of my grad students for a final project did a, um, just a, a quick study about scent, and they had their, uh, so it was partners, uh, um, heterosexual partners, and they would have, they had, it was a group of five women and five men, and the men had to wear a t-shirt throughout the day, um, no landscaping or, or any such thing, just a normal day about town, and then um, had the women smell the t-shirts and every single woman was able to uh, identify the smell of their partner. And this is without cologne and without deodorant. So they were, taught, they were told not to do that. So um, that one very you know, <laughs> empirically sound study done in my class at USF, no it wasn't, but it was really cool and fun, um, <laughs> showed that. But we do respond to scent in a very strong way. Um, especially when we talk about psychotherapy, we talk about psychology, clinically, the olfactory sense is one most tied to memory and is most tied to experience, whether it's traumatic or whether it's joyful. And so, um, so this is something interesting. So women are uh, most aroused by the scent of, let's see if you can guess. No. <laughs> it's a food. No. Come on, ladies. When you're when think about PMS, chocolate, chocolate. So women's pheromones, hormones, all of that good stuff goes up when they smell chocolate. Men are most aroused by. This is very interesting for all of those um, products that we see out there during September, October, and October and November. Pumpkin spice, pumpkin spice. It, so cinnamon buns and pumpkin spice are known to be the most arousing scents for men. Now another interesting thing is, is that um, I did a study on aphrodisiacs and celery, eating celery, which seems very innocuous. It's almost 100% water, um, but what it does, it actually helps to elicit your own harm, your own pheromones, and it makes the opposite sex more attracted to you. Whoa. So oh. in, th for those of you who said alcohol in the back, throw some so Bloody Mary, a little celery in there, and you'll be good to go. Good Thank to go. you so much for this advice. <laughs> I so, have a question, yeah, go ahead. if I may. Um, the, uh, I have a friend in the audience, Janet, who has read a book about uh, female arousal and that on average females are much more easily aroused by a whole suite of things. And it's by Daniel Berger? Daniel Berger, B-E-R-G-N-E-R. -E 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 okay. Um, I, I want to ask you about monogamy and, and, and uh, polygamous relationships and all that. Um, I thought only Donald Trump had polygamous relationships. Oh! oh. No, no, all right, I'm sorry. Jump in and then uh, you take please. it over. Yes. No, all right, political joke, I, I retract it. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Keep America horny. Uh, uh, <laughs> So, um, 
But I, want, I, I wonder, you know, what, uh, do, do, what percent of the animal kingdom mates for life, and what do it just because they feel horny, as you just said? Okay, so less than 1% of the animal kingdom, way less. Uh, I'll look up that number, but it's tiny, are monogamous. Interestingly enough, about humans, in the 1940s, a doctor in Boston Hospital was doing a study on blood types. When you have two, uh, mom and a dad with different blood types, what's the probability that the child will inherit one of the four blood types? What he found from that study was that 20% of the couples, married couples that came in happily married, 20% of the babies that the mother had were not the fathers. He was so, and this is back in the 40s when uh, that was just unheard of. And so he never published it. He kind of put that study uh, in the back. And it turns out that uh, what we thought of, uh, of monogamous uh, coupling in birds, turns out the female oftentimes seeks uh, 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 secondary males, and um, she gets more diversity in the eggs and therefore enhances her probability that if the environment changes, she's got enough diversity that maybe one of the offspring will survive. So this idea of married for life and always your sperm and always my egg, mm, not so much. And, and, and <laughs> Dave, what would, you, what would you say about that question? So we're more of serial monogamists, and it, I believe that that comes from our, um, again, our upbringing and our culture, the sociocultural messages about sex and sexuality is that, again, it is meant for coupling. It's meant for marriage. It's not meant for pleasure. It's meant for procreation. And we miss the boat when uh, we focus just on that. So uh, in terms of marriage, 50%, uh, a little bit over, it's like 53 or 54% of marriages end in divorce um, at this point. Um, one third of marriages, uh, it, it, during a marriage, there is some sort of infidelity. So one third. One third. Yep. Is it mostly men, or is no. it because based on your statistics, twenty percent? Right. Well, why do, why do we have this stereotype that women are much more loyal to their partners? Oh, I, I just want to say, according to the book Daniel Bergman, it's according to the, the latest science, um, women are very pansexual. In other words, when they were you know wired up and they're watching uh, every different kind of sexual congress. They're getting turned on, but they're also hardwired to deny it. And they say, oh, no, that didn't turn. But meanwhile, everything is lighting up. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing that they, I don't know how they got to this. I don't know whether this is, this is a theory, a hypothesis, or whether you know, they have some evidence. But the conjecture, at least, is that women are actually um, more dissatisfied sooner by monogamy, that they need uh, their imagination fired up, they need variety more than men who actually can have the same dinner every night, and, you know. It's not just because they're tired, because they have kids and have jobs and everything else, although that I'm sure contributes, but also because uh, physiologically, they're now saying that women might, might be the ones, in fact, who are basically more polygamous. Not, you know, obviously not society and culturally. That doesn't work very well. But, it, you know, maybe way back prehistorically that was the case. Or cougars. <laughs> <laughs> well, th things yeah. change when women get older. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, well, the statistics are um, it's just uh, under 60% of men who cheat or go outside of a um, loving, committed relationship uh, because there's plenty of people who decide to be an open relationship. So we're talking about people who make a decision, it's just you and me. So oh, just under 60% of males and just under 50% of women are responsible for the infidelity in marriages in our country and in loving, committed relationships, not necessarily just marriages. So, um, and to, to speak to your point about that, I agree fully. Our senses are more fired up. We have lots of bonding. We bond with our own children. We bond with our friends. We have all of this love in our hearts in different ways. And one of the things I talk about a lot is um, we need to remember 
that our partners, our spouse, the one that we've chosen, um, is that, per that one person that we share that intimate physical bond with. I can love my kids, I can love my neighbors, my parents, my brothers and sisters, but sex and physical intimacy is that one thing that keeps you from being super awesome roommates. And it's the one thing that we should focus on uh, because it is so imperative to our mental health, our physical health, our well-being. Uh, but interestingly enough, how you said, the women are more likely to want to go out and to be more sexual. However, again, as I was saying, we're, um, we're highly evolved, but we also we think too much. And when we get in our own heads, what happens is that we diminish our opportunities and the expectations of ourselves and our partners. So on the bell curve, um, in terms of women and arousal, in order to feel fully aroused, excited, ready for sex, women, again, not to be sexist, but on the bell curve need to feel loved, appreciated, understood, affirmed, valued. Okay? On the bell curve, men show their love, affirmation, consideration, that they value their spouse, all of those things through physical affection. So we've got a sticky wicket there. So we've got a moment where if I don't feel that you've connected with me or that I've been ignored or I'm not heard, not feeling heard, and you kind of feel the disconnect as well, you may, and I say you, the collective male, if we are in a heterosexual partnership, you may sidle up as I'm loading the dishwasher angrily to show you how I feel instead of communicating my <laughs> needs and wants as I'm slamming the pots and pans into the dishwasher. You may come up and pat me on the <clears throat> bottom or start rubbing my neck. And instead of me going, oh, you're, sh you're really trying to connect with me, I'm thinking, mm-hmm. And we tense up. We do the exact opposite. So the bid for attention from the male gets completely rejected. The male retreats, and the female says, and he doesn't love me. He's not showing me the love, attention, affirmation. He's saying, I tried to love her through it. She won't let me. She's blocking me. And that's where that so stuff gets So when is the right time for the male to show that love? <laughs> 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 Funny you should ask. Well, we're at the dishwasher. Um, so there's all sorts of love languages, right? So um, acts of service is one of the most um, uh, highly, the percentages of, uh, for women, acts of service, doing things that uh, make life easier. So I always say, you know, empty that dishwasher, throw the laundry in, get the, pit, the kids in the tub, you know, say, sit down, darling, have a glass of wine while I do this, because that's what I call chore play. And chore play, <laughs> chore play leads to chorgasm, okay? <laughs> so so it's meeting each other where you're at. And it's recognizing that this gap between the physical affection and or some of the other love languages, it's, it's a gap that absolutely can be bridged if we acknowledge that it's there. If we just say, you just don't understand me and we don't communicate with each other and we turn our backs, we end up sleeping in separate beds, we end up focusing on just the children, just my work, just whatever, instead of turning towards each other with those bids for attention. Um, Deb, you, you mentioned when we were watching the, the video of the slugs that, uh, it, I don't know why you focused on the slugs, oh. but... Um, <laughs> why not? <laughs> but the, the, the sex between the slugs, who were mo both male and female, but, but they, um, it was like an act of war, you described it. Oh, the, the um, flatworms. Flatworms, I'm sorry, the flatworms. Penis uh, uh, fencing. Oh, oh it's penis arousal, fencing. And it's war. And I just I want you yeah. to put that in context because we, we hear this term sometimes with humans of mm -hmm. makeup sex, and then we know that people go further into, you know, S&M and things like oh, that. So I'm wondering, yeah. you know, and, and I've seen, you know, I've seen dogs. They seem to be fighting with each other just as the prelude before sex. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. talk about the role of of that tension that, you know, that kind of tension that you talked about with the flatworms and, and how it relates to humans. Okay, so depending on the species, but I'll talk about the arousal is uh, aggression and sexuality, especially among men, are really intertwined in the brain. Among most cats and many animals, um, the female invites the male he, uh, among the cats, they have spines on their penis, and it's painful, and it's the 
pain that then elicits the production of eggs because why produce an egg if there's not going to be a male uh, sperm to, to, to fuse with it? So the whole thing about courtship for many animals is aggressive and painful for the female. You see them biting, nipping, um, and what that does is in some strange way, and, and biology is, is, can be odd, turns her reproductive organs on. Mm. And um, that's so it's pretty common. About that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I will say this about humans, uh, after war, many males who have been fighting bloody battles then go in and will rape the remaining females. Um, biologically, I can divide this class into two, or this group into two, and I can say um, this group goes in, uh, we go in and we slaughter everybody, and then we mate and we have two offspring here, one male, two females. Over here, we only kill the males, and then we rape all the females that are remaining. And so we not only have two offspring here, but we've got multiple offspring coming there. So biologically, humans are programmed to fight for territories, take it over, spare the females. And it's why we think we have breasts. We're the only mammal that has breasts or uh, swollen um, mammary glands our whole adult life. Every other fe uh, mammal, the mammary glands are only swollen during lactation, but we think it's, it was a way of identifying females and not killing them and saving them for reproduction. Well, in, in terms of that tension, too, I mean, when you talk about rapes, mm -hmm. clearly socially unacceptable and, and, and I think violence during sex in which somebody gets hurt, right. socially unacceptable. <laughs> but it would seem to me that, that, that there are there is some level of tension that adds to the excitement. Exactly. Do you want, Dave, you want to talk about that? Well, <laughs> well, um, well, obviously any sort of sexual, uh, sexual violence is, as you said, is not okay. And I think that we've gotten away from talking about consent and um, some of the healthiest couples are the ones who communicate explicitly about sexual matters. Um, because if you can talk about sex, you can talk about anything. You can talk about leaving your socks on the floor instead of putting them in the damn hamper. I mean, so <laughs> if you're having good conversations about sex, your wants and your needs, um, and that could be lots of different things. I think because of our puritanical views that we have about sexuality, things that may involve um, you know, any sort of bondage or, or pain play or anything like that seems completely out of the ordinary because we're supposed to lay there like this and <laughs> smile and you know it's supposed to there's there's not a lot of variety that we talk about in the sexual world as humans but it really is there and um, testosterone is responsible for libido in both men and women it's it's born out of the the gonads as well as the adrenal glands which sit on top of the kidneys and we've all got those and so um, that aggression or that desire for sex in humans we have to again use our prefrontal cortex to say wait a second does this fit the time the space the place the obviously consent um, but we do have those internal drives and desires that are driven um, by testosterone. Um, we're just, we don't necessarily do the things that I want to add to the, the animal world. When the male is extra rough, when the me female says enough, he, he lets go. And she really controls how much pain and trauma she's, uh, arousal and trauma she's willing to have. I will say this, I did a whole study on S&M and, and uh, through a friend of mine actually and uh, gave- That's what they always say to me, <laughs> There's for a friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, the, I know. There's a questionnaire, and I actually had my students in one of my classes look at this questionnaire, 100 questions, and it, you end up, the, the dom and the sub, mm -hmm. end up uh, communicating with each other. And I thought, man, this is so cool. And the, the, so they'd come up with an idea, um, you know, paddling. And uh, sure, like to try it. And then there's a safe word. And one of the choices was, if you try that, I'll call the police. So you went through this mm -hmm. thing. I encourage all couples 
to actually go online and look up this questionnaire. Mm -hmm. It just, I think it's a great way to start communicating with each other. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but you brought up a great point. Mm -hmm. uh, when I talked about couples who talk about sexuality and their, and their sex that they're about to have explicitly really do communicate better than most couples. And those who are in um, polyamorous um, uh, relationships or who are swingers, who, um, you know, per the what we were That's talking about one. here tonight, but who are swingers and are monogamous emotionally but have different sexual partners are some of the happiest couples. They, you never see them in marriage and sex therapy because they're the ones who are talking about those hard limits. They're talking mm -hmm. about what they desire. They're talking about what feels good to them. They're talking about what I feel like I could allow or don't want and what do I, why, what do I want with just you and what are we willing to do with other people. And we may be having those fantasies. We may be thinking about those things but never bringing it up to our partners because again of these constraints, these, soci these social constraints that we feel that what it means to be married in the United States in 2016 and what that looks like. And so we, we stay right on line with those very rigid belief systems that were created a long, long time ago. And yet we may have those urges or desires, but we want to appear as if, and we want to go along with those constraints that, you know, when we got, we put the big old white dress on and the tuxedo and all that good <laughs> stuff. And what happens is, is that we cheat because we may have the same exact urges and we may have the same desires. And instead of expressing to my partner, you know, I may want to explore this or I may want to think, you know, try something that's a little bit different. What do you think about that? We just keep quiet and we think, oh my gosh, they think that I'm a pervert. They'd never go along <laughs> with it. They don't want me. But an exercise that I do with my couple, my clients. Yes, did you need to, are we? Um, Sorry. Finish your thoughts and I Okay, <laughs> so um, so one of the things that I encourage my couple clients to do is called the fantasy box. And it's <clears throat> writing down the top five things that either you really, really enjoyed uh, sexually previously with that partner, maybe with somebody else, or something that you may wanna try, that you may not have experienced before. And so you write the five things, you put it in a hat or you put it in a box and then you choose. And I love what you said about the absolutely, I'm calling the police if you even ask me to do this. <laughs> there are some, so the answers to those are, are varied and it could be um, absolutely not, this is not something that I'm interested in and I just don't want to. Um, absolutely not, I'm not interested in this and I really don't want to, okay, but maybe I never even thought about it before, so let me rescind that and then I'm gonna think about it a little bit. And then there is, um, I'm gonna think about it, maybe interesting, but I need to take some time. And then there's the, which is, I would say, my dime store research here in my practice, 85 to 90% of the time, which is, you wanna do this? I might wanna do this. And then they find that the same exact fantasies are in the box and when they go and they choose right. from each other. But it's opening up that line of communication where they can really broaden and deepen their, um, their sexual repertoire. But, but do they normally, um, I hate to say play together, or do they separately agree to have these? And it's sex versus love to me. So they have to you know, satisfy that sexual desire and then, or they together what do you mean? Do you mean if they're well, swinging? They, do you mean the when they're... The couples that you don't see. <laughs> right. That, that tend to be open with their conversation. Right. Like, do they play together or do they... Yes, they, there's all sorts of variety for that. I mean, there could be, um, it depends on whatever floats your boat. So you can go and as a couple, you can just watch, you can go to a club and you can watch another couple who, um, you know, who's having sex. Or you could, um, one partner can say, okay, well, you're, you know, how do you feel about going and being with someone while I watch? Or I'll watch you. Or there's mutual masturbation. It's not necessarily always intercourse either. Again, our vision of sex is this, right? This is all we got. <laughs> that's what sex is. And that's not it. So there's all sorts of outer course and foreplay and lots of things that we do to produce orgasm and really amazing sensations that we don't think about if it's not penis and vagina sex for babies. <laughs> and so if we can broaden our horizons and our mindset about what that may look like, it could be any number of things. I, you know, I'm surprised to hear you say that, that these relationships, though, 
are the kind that don't come in to ask for counseling because I would guess, I mean, our stereotype, certainly mine, is that these relationships there, um, would be unstable mm -hmm. and that there would be jealousy on the part of one partner or the other partner. But <clears throat> I hear you saying that they have such deep communication that they really go beyond uh, and they're able to express everything. Mm -hmm. So by having that deep communication, I'm, I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth. Right, but. no, but you're, you're right. But what, what's really going on is that, that deep mammalian thing of wanting to go out and have different partners, but the communication is just saying it versus going and sidling up to Bob at the water cooler on Monday and having an affair. Because yeah. it's happening. It's happening with, again, up to 50% of women and up to 60% of men who are in these committed relationships. They're doing it. They're just doing it outside of the context of their commitment with one another versus couples who swing or have open marriages or who, in poly or who are in polyamorous relationships that say, this is what I'd like to do. What do you think about that? And then they decide to explore it together, which deepens the bond versus wow. creating a rift. Amazing. So let's take some questions. So we've got a question here, a question there, a question there. Let's, let's take from the middle of the audience here. Hi there. Uh, I'm wondering if there are statistics about the longevity of these relationships, polyamorous types of relationships. Uh, you know, I think, I mean, my sense is they would be good for a while, but, you know, there'd be issues that would come up. I mean, I think we're naturally jealous creatures biologically. I think what happens is is that um, again ages and stages relationships go in waves you know we um, we start out really hot and heavy and then we bond with one another uh, we build careers maybe we have children um, we then um, kind of we kind of get really kind of baseline and calm with things and we may be dealing with aging parents so there's all sorts of waves job changes life changes and so during all of those different pieces and pockets there are even in a, in a uh, monogamous relationship, there's all sorts of waves. And so the same thing happens in uh, a relationship that isn't monogamous, that during those ages and stages, I know plenty of couples who take breaks from being, it's called it being in the lifestyle. So if you're a swinger and you take part in that sort of thing, that take breaks for being in the lifestyle. If they're feeling disconnected from one another, or if they recognize that um, they no longer want to be a part of that while something else is going on in their world. So it doesn't mean necessarily that we have that, again, we have this mindset that sex is a one-time talk and that's it. It's not just a one-time talk like, okay, we're going to be swingers. We're going to be swingers forever. We're going to be 80 years old and going up to the clubs and, um, and key parties and doing all that kind of stuff. So it really is about ages and stages and keeping that communication open and that... Um, and sometimes couples, people do, one or the other party will change their minds that this was something that was fun when we were younger and or when we were newly in love and we were experiencing this or after we'd been together for a long time and we were looking for something to spice things up and then we decided to do this. Most couples who are participating in this behavior do that to deepen their marital or their relationship dyad. They're not doing it to separate themselves. They're doing it to bring pleasure to their partner, pleasure to themselves and to deepen the, the core relationship. So um, I think that it's not necessarily like, well, if you swing, like how long, what's the longevity of the swinging? Do you stay in it and do you stay together? It really goes just, it ebbs and flows just like any relationship would. And it's, it's you know, constant communication of, is this still okay for us? And I have plenty of people who um, decide that they're kind of done with it, that they received what they were looking for and, um, and now they have a greater experience, but they're, they're kind of done. The couples that are very unhappy or that I find that don't make it is when they come in and they'll talk to me, but yes, we were all for it and we decided together to do this, but then in therapy it ekes out that one or the other really was doing it for the other person or they were doing it at the prompting of the other person and they never really had that buy-in and they never really had that sense that they were safe in doing that. And so I do see that certainly. Okay, so we've got a question here, a question here, a question in the back. Let's start in the back, and then we'll come forward. Yes, uh, if anybody can answer that up there. It's just, is, is the internet or social media um, uh, today uh, contributed to this 15, 60% of people uh, that uh, go out on their, on their partners and seek some other remedy for their marriage? Is it, is it helping, or is it, is it 
part of the equation? Well, I would say, well, hmm, very interesting because uh, I have <laughs> yeah, something I can say. <laughs> Not quite what you asked but there was a study on young men who went on the internet not to find a mate, but <coughs> pornography. And what they're finding is they keep looking for something more and more exciting so that when they go out to date and they find a girl, it's no big deal. They can't get the erection. Mm -hmm. so That's a, very true. Dysfunction. That's very true. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of clients in my practice for erectile <laughs> dysfunction right. as, a, um, as a result of pornography addiction. So if you think about, like, um, so pornography addiction or sex addiction is not, is not exactly like a substance addiction because substances will actually change our brain chemistry. Um, but what can happen <clears> is, is that repeated exposure to pornography can shift our neural pathways and can um, create a sense of needing to more and more. We develop a tolerance, if you will. So something that was very sexy and arousing, once you see that, 20, 30 times, then all of a sudden you want to up the ante, and then you go and you look at something else that seems more exciting or titillating, and then you go and you go and you go. Well, if you are spending a large portion of your time on the internet looking at these um, very radical views of bodies and sexuality and sexual pleasure and what that looks like, because most <laughs> pornography is not what real sex looks like. Just want to let everybody know. <laughs> our bodies fall out of position. We make funny noises. Our bodies don't look like that. But besides the point, um, we can't last that long. It doesn't feel that good, my goodness. And then there you go. <laughs> so. So with all of that being said, so again, we build up that tolerance, and so a normal human being, um, for both males and female, the ability to become aroused, maintain arousal, and to have an orgasm is greatly diminished by, by um, continued use of pornography. So, but the internet is interesting. So one of the things that I see is when we talk about social media, we look at Facebook and Twitter and all of those connective devices and, and um, I see lots of people who have, are now um, divorced or going through separation because they have found a long lost love that would have never been, that would have never been available to them if social media had not afforded them that opportunity, which is very interesting. And it's almost a chicken and the egg type of thing. It's like, okay, well, am I unhappy in my current marriage? And then I'm wistfully thinking about the glory days. And so, you know, so the your boyfriend from high school or college becomes that much more enticing. Or because of ages and stages, did you go off to school? Did you start a job? Did they move away? Was that really your soulmate? And so it, it's, it's very interesting. I've seen both sides of that, of being able to um, not only maintain relationships because we're more connected, but then also create rifts and or is it just putting a microscope on your relationship that may not be so happy and that you may have decided to be in for convenience rather than for passion and love. All right, let's go. Ma'am, did you have a question? Um, I wanted to actually talk about the longevity of poly relationships. I've met poly families of, I think, their family is six people, and they've been together for 40 years. So it can last. Mm -hmm. but really, I think it does depend on, you know, did you go into this because you wanted it or because you were kind of strong-armed into it? Um, but I kind of wanted to ask about uh, what you think the effect of, like, the economy is on polyamorous relationships and things like that. That's interesting. So, um, and that may be a good question for you in terms of value and seeking value in the animal kingdom and, and how many mates we need <laughs> to be able to do that. So let me just make a differentiation between um, swinging, which is um, having a, uh, you know, a couple dyad and then making a decision to be uh, monogamous emotionally, but then to go outside of that relationship for sex, and polyamorous relationships, which are relationships with two or more partners um, that decide to be emotionally and sometimes physically committed to one another 
or another and another and another and another. So there may be um, you know, different dyads or triads that are involved in the polyamorous relationships. And I think that um, living arrangements, uh, when you talk about the economy, living arrangements, child rearing, these are things that we've always right. done in social circles, especially in the animal kingdom, where uh, we don't have that, we don't put the fences up and don't talk to our neighbors anymore and all of those things that we do now. We used to rally around dinner tables and help raise each other's children and things like that. So I think it's actually more, it seems more biologically sound than what we've, mm -hmm. how we've created these um, kind of pockets for ourselves as human beings now. I think if we go back in time, there's a couple of studies from the Swedes that suggest that we come from a harem mating system where there was one large male and multiple females that actually helped, like the lions and some of the gorillas. And uh, the elephants have a uh, matriarchal <laughs> system where the males go off and wander and come back to mate. So there are many examples uh, in the... I think in the m among the mammals are, are the bonobos um, female. Oh, <clears throat> are they man. female oriented? <laughs> the bonobos are the they. Uh, the, so there are two chimpanzee species. There's the uh, uh, pan chim chimps and the bonobos. Bonobos are smaller. The pan chimps fight. They have groups, they go off, they actually will kill and uh, tear apart the offspring from another tribe, if you will. The monobos make love, and you will have females on females, males on males, females on males. They just share genitalia, right and left, <laughs> all day long, and if there's a squabble, immediately they make up, and they go the G-rubbing, they call it, uh, <laughs> genital rubbing <laughs> in the females. It's just they're the most sexy so animals sorry. out so front. And I know. <laughs> <laughs> are, 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 are they a successful community, or are or, they on the verge of extinction? Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> they're highly successful. They do a lot of the 69, too, the oral sex. It's great to watch them. Um, oh, I never thought about doing it that way. And yeah, uh, no, the, the, the worry is their habitats being taken over. So there is that issue. But the, the other worry is um, diseases. And there's always this issue of when there's a lot of sexuality, sexual behavior, um, are the diseases going to maybe suppress that a little bit? I don't know. Yeah. We have two questions down in front. Evolutionarily thinking, um, as a human species, we seem to have gotten away from what comes naturally sexual. With religious uh, implications, societal, all sorts of other things that. And repression, being, religious repression. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and a lot of it being male oriented. <coughs> Are we slowly coming around, back around to a natural state uh, that includes homosexuality, transsexuality, transgender, the whole spectrum that exists that's always been denied? Are we slowly, do you think, coming back around to, you have still got a long way to go, but are we slowly getting back to that? I can address it. Sure. Uh, I'll start. You can finish. It's great. Um, as far as I know, and this is more my opinion, a little bit of reading, it's not my area exactly, uh, the three single god religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, have really, the press, the uh, pressure was to replace the pagan sexual fun uh, I don't know the term polyamorous, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a new term for me. That was a way of life. They have, these religions have um, taken that and set that aside and, and uh, rewarded work. 
and we have this amazing technological society uh, restructured the environment and uh, uh, we think more than half of Earth now is uh, under construction at some level. Um, it's different. I have no idea where we're going with this. I mean, it's an experiment. We have one Earth, one set of humans, but we are the most invasive species, uh, large species on Earth, bar, <coughs> bar none. Um, yeah, well, I think that <clears throat> we are always fighting what comes naturally to us. It's like, does it, is it okay? Does it look okay? Is it going to be okay? What will other people think of me? Uh, we're placing a lot of that on there. And I think, again, societally, we, um, we have very strong and, and strict ways to look at it. You know, sex is dirty, wrong, and bad, in, 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 unless if it's under the context in which we're taught and told by our parents, our teachers, our mentors, our religious leaders, that it's okay. And it really does a huge number on us. And one of the analogies that I give is, it's like, okay, so think about, some people have allergies, so we'll think about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So you are told from birth that if you eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you're gonna die, okay? Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are bad, they're wrong, they're dirty, they will make you sick. As you get older, the developmental messages about the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches will change. You'll get a reputation if you eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, people will judge you if you eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Sure, they look delicious and they're pretty sweet and good, but do not eat those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They're bad for you, they're dirty and they're wrong. And then what happens is, on the happiest day of our lives, we put on the big white dress or the tuxedo and look all spiffy and shiny. We meet the partner of our dreams at the top of the, at the, top of the aisle in front of God, our friends, family, and everybody. We <coughs> profess our love to that person, and then they hand you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> and they say, no, 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 go no, ahead. No, okay. you can do it. Eat your sandwich. No, this sandwich is the most wonderful and beautiful thing that two people who love each other could ever share. <laughs> Enjoy your sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so not only are we like, can, can, I, can I eat the sandwich? <laughs> can I? So we have all those ingrained messages about sexuality and our bodies being bad. We talked about the messages before, the words we use in profanity to put people down, to put ourselves down, to curse and to yell. And we say, this is what, is, this is what your body is about, and this is what sexuality is about, but now eat your sandwich. We have no idea, do we like it chunky? Do we like it smooth? Crusts on or off? We want strawberry? Do we want grape? What do we, we don't even know how we like our sandwiches. And I can tell you that a majority of the work that I do in my practice in terms of any sort of sex therapy is helping people kind of reboot and go back to that more um, <coughs> natural state of desiring sex and feeling like it is good and it feels nice and it is healthy. And it's a nice thing for me instead of all of those messages that are, are kind of piled on us that we all say, okay, well, that's, our, that's how we do it you know, here. <coughs> yeah, actually, I have a question. Um, how does, I mean, Sorry, I didn't mean to moderate for you. Ron mentioned, you know, the endorphins that, like the bonding hormones that, you know, we all experience during sex. So how does that, that seems like a complication as far as polyamory or swinging. Not so much polyamory, I guess, because there are mm -hmm. multiple bonds, but it's certainly swinging mm -hmm. because you, you've got these hormones, but, but, you're, but you're committed to one person, so that seems like a conflict. It certainly could, because when you're you're in that loving, committed relationship, we're you know emitting um, oxytocin, vasopressin, which sadly, remember how I talked about you know all of the the cocktail of being newly in love, which are all um, you know bring you up and make you high. Well, vasopressin, oxytocin are sedatives, and they make you really squishy and squishy, and make you love each other and just stay together. So when you are introducing other partnerships into that. The chemical bonds, that can get a little confusing. But again, as I said before, as humans, we're terrible at listening to those types of things, and we intellectualize, and we use our brains, and we say, no, we're going to do this, and we won't let it happen. <coughs> now, it, it certainly can happen. And if someone is 
more virile or or sexier to you or you know what's it's called sexual cathexis that whom we are sexually attracted to it's locked in by the time we're five years old every single one of you has a type you can think about it right now and go hmm. <laughs> everybody has a type it doesn't mean that you have to mate with that type. It doesn't mean that you'll marry that type. It just means that there is a type of human being that you are sexually attracted to and everybody's got it. And what can happen is, is if you are sexually connected to someone more than you are your partner, then some of that can go haywire. And it's interesting you talked about the study about um, mating and, and, um, and, and sperm, and I'm trying to think of what the context you used was, but there have been studies that have shown that if a woman has two partners, and if she is, um, she is more likely to be impregnated by her lover than she is by her spouse. Deeper orgasm, more exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and deeper orgasm would lead to? Mm -hmm. Holding mm -hmm. the sperm. Uh -huh. Absolutely. More sex? More sex? Yeah. Could Obviously. be too. Yes. So I think, I think, Howard, do we have time for one or two or no one. more? One more. Okay. <laughs> he's like, Sir he's in the like, green. Oh my God. <laughs> he's like, one. Wow. Yeah. It's so lonely. It's <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you've been, you've been holding your hand up for a while. We've, we've sort of danced around this, but you talked a lot about suppressing urges, basically, mm -hmm. hormone driven urges, uh, or, or ignoring them. Uh, do you think that's? So we have to suppress those urges. If you, you know, when you're a kid, you go out and kill everybody that pisses you off on the playground. You're, you're not very civilized. <laughs> right. Um, it, do you think that, that the suppression of sexual urges is just a byproduct of that? We get so used to suppressing strong urges. Perhaps. I mean, I think that's it's a great question. Um, I think that the suppression is it's, it's nature and nurture. You know, obviously we want to um, we want to appear a certain way again towards the people that we're looking to mate with, and in our social circles, nobody wants to be that outcast from the social circle, whether you're an animal or whether you're a human being, well, which is an animal as well. Um, <laughs> but we, I think that we want to keep things copacetic, and that we want to be part of that bonded human context, and so um, I think that the suppression of whether it's violent or aggressive, like I'm going to go after your wife or your husband, you know, that kind of stuff is not welcomed in, in our culture, and so you're going to be outcast, and then you're going to be, you know, a hermit in a cave by yourself, and we don't do well like that. We end up scratching our own skin. We do. We end up becoming very <laughs> anxious and very depressed as a result of that, and so psychologically, that wouldn't serve us well. And so I think that the suppression <laughs> is both self-serving as well as an attempt to bond and connect. And, and Deb, final word, how does that play out in the animal community? It's, it's so context-driven. Animals are thinking animals and feeling emotional animals just like we are. And so what you might do in one environment, you wouldn't do in another. And we just, all of us are like amoeba. We're just kind of feeling our way through the issue of suppression, I think, depends on whether you're with your family, with another social group, in a strange community, by yourself. It just, I mean, we all, all animals have that. Oh, I don't want to do that because he's bigger than I am. And uh, I do want to do this because she's got bigger boobs than my other partner and blah, blah, blah. So it's it's a tough question, a good question, but a tough one to answer. I love what you said. We're, we're all amoebas. We're just trying to get along. Yeah. We're just trying to, <laughs> trying to make our way. Make our way Just trying to make our way. Yeah. yeah. Like amoebas. Best we can. Right. This is a great audience. It's a great topic. Yeah. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Always. So you're going to close? Well, I'll just say so thank you, you again to Rob Lorai and Dr. Sheridan and Dr. Castle. Um, I don't know about you, but you know I've learned some new um, words tonight, like yeah. chore play. <laughs> That's a new one for me. Chore play, I love that. Um, and I also, I often wonder, is, um, where'd Susan, Wall Susan Wallace left? But there are certain 
um, perfumes and colognes that elicit mm -hmm. some reaction. Mm -hmm. And so Chanel Mademoiselle does it for me. <laughs> I don't know if anyone does that, but, but it does it for me. Um, but again, thank you for your time tonight. Thank, thank you for you, everyone Howard. for joining us. And I know we went over yeah. time, but please look out for our next series.